It's 1932. The Great Depression rips the world. Times are worse than tough. They're desperate. Many men are out of work. But the country doesn't want for male heroes. Women suffer in different ways, and usually they suffer alone. There's almost only one escape. The movies. You pay your 25 cents, and you walk into a darkened theater. And for the first time, you see her. A shock of platinum hair, a body barely contained by her skin-tight gown. A bad girl who breaks all the rules. She is Jean Hart. Keep away from me, I'm warning you. Why don't you do it? Keep away from me. You don't dare stay here. You don't trust yourself. Do it again, I like it. Do it again. In olden days, a glimpse of stocking was looked down as something shocking. Now, heaven knows anything goes. And good authors, too, who once knew better words, now only use for letter words, right and right. The world has gone mad today, and good's bad today, and black's white today, and day's night today, when most guys today, the women prize today, are just silly gigolos. So though I'm not a great romancer, I'm sure that I'm bound to answer when you propose. Anything goes. Hey, that hurts a little bit. You don't like to be hurt, do you? Oh, I don't know. Kind of fun sometimes if it's not in the right spirit. Hello, I'm Sharon Stone. Harlow was a superstar at 19, a legend at 26. She played opposite the greatest stars of her time, Gable, Tracy, Powell, and Cagney. She combined sophisticated comic timing with a flawless naturalism. She made blue noses gasp, women grin, and men extremely hot beneath their collars. She embodied sex when the very word was seldom uttered in mixed company. She was, and still is, beloved by millions. And yet no star has been more misunderstood or had more lies written about her. She was accused of being as trampy as the role she played. But the truth is altogether different and much more surprising. Together we'll discover a woman who was at war with her screen persona, yet whose life and films became strangely interwoven. It's one of the most unexpected stories in Hollywood history. Amazingly, the notorious blonde bombshell came from a well-to-do, respectable background. She was a child of privilege, born Harleen Carpenter in 1911 in Kansas City, Missouri. Her mother's name was Jean Harlow. Mother Jean's father dealt in real estate, and Mother Jean was a force to be reckoned with. My little baby, that's who you are. My little baby, you'll be a star. Mother Jean was obsessed with her daughter. All her life, she would call Harleen the baby. In 1922, when Harleen was 11, Mother Jean divorced her husband, a mild-mannered dentist, and took the baby to Hollywood. After enrolling Jean in the Hollywood School for Girls, Mother Jean chased her dream of being a movie star. She did not get a single acting job and returned in defeat to Kansas City with her daughter. In 1926, mother and daughter each fell in love. Mother Jean was swept off her feet by Marino Bello, a dashing Italian with the smooth charm of a gigolo and no visible means of support. While Harleen fell in love with Charles Fremont McGrew II, a wealthy young playboy of 20. Most parents wouldn't approve of their 16-year-old daughter dropping out of high school to get married, but Chuck McGrew had social status and was about to come into a sizable fortune. For Mother Jean, it was too good a match for her daughter to pass up. Don't you worry about me. Blondes never go broke. It's no secret, honey. I've always had a man with money. Some people think it's kind of funny, but I just love a man Early in 1928, 
Harlene and her new husband moved back to California where he bought a mansion in Beverly Hills. Her mother soon followed with Bello. The life of the idle rich bored Harlene. She was looking for something to do with her time. Soon, she found it. Harlene got her first film work on a dare. Some society friends bet her $250 that she didn't have the nerve to try out for a movie part. Taking the dare, she went to Central Casting. The name she gave them wasn't her own, but her mother's, Jean Harlow. Almost at once, the beautiful teenager was offered extra work. Harlene wasn't interested. Then Mother Jean found out. Still dazzled by her own former dreams of stardom, she pushed the baby into the movies. Harlene Carpenter was now Jean Harlow. Just two months after she started acting, Harlow was getting featured bit parts. This one with Laurel and Hardy seemed guaranteed to catch the public's attention. Chuck McGrew didn't want his wife to work at all, much less with her clothes off. If Harlow's career strained her marriage, Mother Jean's control of her daughter destroyed it. Harlow believed that Mother knew best. Forced to choose between her husband and her career, she sought a divorce at age 18. I'm just an innocent girl! Hey, wait a minute! Wait for baby! Hollywood's sex symbol of the silent era met the first sex symbol of the talkies in Saturday Night Kid. The film starred Clara Bow, the it girl of the 20s, and it featured Harlow's first speaking part. Come on, kid. We've only got... A half an hour before the curtain rings up. Harlow's first lines on the screen were forgettable, but her next role would launch her to stardom. A rich young Texan named Howard Hughes had first shot Hell's Angels as a silent film. But in 1929, the talkies were causing a sensation. He wanted to convert Hell's Angels to a talkie. But its original leading lady, Greta Nissen, had a distinct Norwegian accent. Hughes searched in vain for six months to cast a part of an unknown. Finally, he shot a screen test of Jean Harlow. She was young, inexperienced, and would work cheap. For the lead female role in one of the most expensive film productions ever, Hughes paid Harlow only $100 a week. He also signed Harlow to a five-year contract. It was the best investment he ever made. To showcase Harlow, Hughes decided to shoot this party scene using the two-strip Technicolor process. To audiences accustomed only to black and white, the result was a sensation. And so was Jean Harlow. There she is. Don't point, it's rude. Oh, Helen. Roy! Here was a star with a bold new look and an even bolder immorality. One who captured the broken spirit of an America sent reeling by the recent stock market crash. How do you do? How do you do? And one who would redefine sex in cinema for once and forever. May I have this next dance? Of course. She was 19 years old. This provocative scene did more than help make Harlow a star. It gave the world an unforgettable catchphrase. Would you be shocked if I put on something more comfortable? I'll try to survive. Hell's Angels didn't just open, it exploded. Hell's Angels, the opening of this picture at Raman's Chinese Theater in Hollywood, was the biggest premiere ever seen anywhere in the world before or since. 500,000 people are lining the street. Jean Harlow. Thank you. I would like to use this occasion to publicly thank Mr. Hughes for the opportunity he gave me. Suddenly, Jean Harlow was one of the most recognizable women in the world. 
Her platinum blonde hair was her trademark. And until then, only tramps and floozies had bleached their hair. But now, nice women were peroxiding theirs like Harlow's and Harlow. Her image was selling everything from cigarettes to soap. Howard Hughes owned Harlow's contract. To cash in on her overnight success, he pushed her into as many movies as possible. Hughes charged the studios thousands of dollars for her services, but paid Harlow only a few hundred dollars a week. You must get paid pretty well when you work. Oh, tremendous. Harlow couldn't act yet, and she knew it. Oh, my bashful boy. After her next few performances... You are different, Tommy. Her audiences knew it, too. Very different. And I've discovered it isn't only a difference in manner and outward appearances. It's a difference in basic character. The men I know, and I've known dozens of them. After several embarrassing performances, Harlow was becoming a national joke. Maybe the platinum blonde was only fool's gold after all. Trick's been coming kind of tough lately, huh? Oh, I was all right until I got the flu. Show business? Movies. All the directors admired my talent. But you gotta be on the inside. In 1931, the studios had the absolute power to make and break careers. And as far as they were concerned, Harlow was history. Assuming she was washed up, Harlow told her agent she planned to work in a store. It looked like Jean Harlow was going to be a has-been at 20. In 1931, the Great Depression had hit rock bottom. Millions were out of work. And though still under contract to Howard Hughes, Jean Harlow feared that she too would be unemployed. What happened next seemed like a Hollywood movie. Every actress in Hollywood knew that Metro Golden Mayor had the power and prestige to make stars out of nobodies. Meaning me? Yes, you. What do you do for a living? Stenographer. Working now? No. What do you do for a living if you're not working? Look for work. That's all. But listen, sister. You're not walking around this town without being watched, see? Keep your nose clean. Paul Byrne was the most revered MGM producer on the lot. He had already helped start the careers of Greta Garbo, Norma Shear, and Joan Crawford, the great leading ladies of the MGM lot. Byrne persuaded MGM to give Harlow a part in Beast of the City. Her performance was anything but prim and proper. I don't mind taking orders, but there's one decision that's always up to me. Come on, sit up like a lady. I know that trick. Oh, unintentional, mister. Say, do you think I'm so dumb as to pull a gag like that? You might. You're built for it. Despite Harlow's strong performance, no film offers followed. Byrne wanted MGM to buy out her contract from Howard Hughes. Louis B. Mayer objected. MGM's female stars were ladies, and Mayer thought Harlow was no lady. But Harlow was proving a phenomenon as she sold out theater after theater on an East Coast personal appearance tour. At Byrne's insistence, Mayer bought out Hughes's contract for a whopping $30,000. Always the showman, Hughes would forever after claim that the studio had paid him twice as much. Yen for a copper. Are you gonna try and reform me, huh? What for? The studio gave Harlow the star treatment. MGM's wardrobe and makeup departments helped create a more stylish image for her. And with artful lighting and careful composition, ace MGM cameraman Harold Rawson played up her hair and eyes and played down her nose and chin. But it was Paul Byrne who really made the difference when he convinced the studio's most famous platinum blonde to play a brazen redhead. So gentle. Yes, they do. Can you see through this? I'm afraid you can, miss, but I'll wear it. At first, Harlow hated the script of Red-Headed Woman. Though she had played tramps before, this movie required her character to sleep with no fewer than five of her male co-stars. I love my wife. I've never loved anybody else. Why, we've been sweethearts ever since we were kids. Yes, but she doesn't need to know about us. 
Harlow worried that people would confuse her with the character, but Byrne convinced her to give the part a comedic touch. He sensed that Harlow had the unique gift to make sex funny. Red, this is insane. Oh, no, it isn't. Red, we've got to snap out of it, both of us. But why? We can see each other. You can come to my place any time. No, I won't do Nobody that. will ever know about it. Please. I won't, Red. Listen, tomorrow night. Say you'll come tomorrow night. Listen, 10 o'clock. You say... Don't, Red. All right, then say you'll come. Say it. All right, I'll come. Harlow plays Lil, a small-town secretary who climbs the ladder of success. Man by man. I won't go, and you better see me. She begins with her boss. I ask me, he doesn't love you. He loves me because he told me so. Will you shut up? Oh, you didn't love me, did you, when you kissed me that night at the log cabin? You didn't love me when we made our date to meet in my apartment. Well, why didn't you keep your word? Why didn't you come as you promised? You get out of here. You can't lead me on like that, make dates with me and break them and not even explain. We're in each other's blood. There isn't anything on earth that can stop us. Not anything on earth, and you know it. This way, please. Please, dear, open the door. This way, madam. I don't need a guy, and don't call me madam. She snapped him in. Give me that key. Oh, you're afraid. You're afraid of yourself because you know you love me. Oh, am I? Yeah, you're afraid you're going to take me in your arms. You're afraid you're going to kiss me. Is that so? Well, why don't you do it? Keep away from me. I'm warning you. Why don't you do it? Keep away from me. You don't dare stay here. You don't trust yourself. Oh, do it again. I like it. Do it again. Will you please give me that key? Soon, she seduces an elderly millionaire and blackmails him into helping her gain acceptance in society. Shunned as a social climber, she attacks the rich hypocrites who scorn her. I'm through with the whole cheap hypocritical gang of you, but I'm not going to get out of this town until I tell you just what you are. You're all a lot of half-witted, half-baked, small-town trite. Well, I know who put you up to it. It was that four-faced, double-crossing ex-wife of Bill's. You did it. You did it, you dirty double crosser, because you wanted the whole town to say they walked out of little agendas to go to Irene. Red, what are you doing? Take your hands off of me. All right, let them say it. It'll be the first time you have thrown down broken up. Get in there. What made Redheaded Woman especially scandalous was its ending. Instead of repenting, reforming, or paying for her sins, the standard Hollywood rule, Lil comes out a winner. She ends up on the arm of an elderly French aristocrat, who also has a particularly handsome chauffeur. Moral crusaders were outraged by the film's amoral message. Red-headed woman was considered so shocking it was banned in Britain, though King George V was said to keep a print in Buckingham Palace. Despite the controversy, Harlow conquered audiences and critics alike. No film Jean Harlow ever made was more in contrast with her real self, for beneath her film image as a brazen, gutsy woman, an old-fashioned housewife was struggling to get out. The truth was, Harlow lived at home with her mother. For her, show business was a pastime, not a passion. Her mother ruled her life, and Harlow was every inch the obedient daughter. She longed to quit the movies and settle down with Mr. Wright. To Harlow, it looked like Mr. Wright was Paul Byrne. For months, Byrne had escorted Harlow to parties and premieres like the one captured in this rare newsreel film. But no one suspected they might be linked romantically. After all, she was one of Hollywood's most desirable women, and the balding, pot-bellied, middle-aged Byrne was no Clark Gable. But Harlow adored him. For unlike Howard Hughes, who had exploited her, Byrne believed in Harlow's talent. He was dedicated to her career. Despite his moodiness and bouts of depression, Byrne behaved like a gentleman. If you'll be my hero, I'll be your little girl. When we're together, I'm safe.
from all the world. On July 2nd, 1932, a week after this Redheaded Woman opened, Harlow and Byrne were married. The ceremony was an intimate gathering that featured the ruling royalty of Hollywood, including MGM's boy wonder Irving Thalberg and producer David O. Selznick. Two months later, as Harlow was midway through her much-awaited pairing with Clark Gable in Red Dust, the dark psychological problems that haunted Paul Byrne took a drastic turn. On the evening of September 4th, 1932, he argued with Harlow about her domineering mother. Harlow stormed off to spend the night at Mother Jean's. She never saw her husband alive again. On Labor Day morning, September 5th, 1932, Paul Byrne stood naked in his dressing room, put a 38 revolver to his head, and pulled the trigger. Suddenly, Jean Harlow was plunged into one of the most bizarre scandals in Hollywood history, a scandal that still provokes controversy today. Pieced together, the events of the tragedy are as melodramatic as any MGM movie. The morning Paul Byrne's body was found, long before the police were called, the most powerful men in Hollywood, Louis B. Mayer, Irving Thalberg, and David O. Selznick, rushed over to his house for damage control. They didn't come to protect Harlow. Instead, they came to shield the studios and themselves. The studio moguls were used to constructing movie plots. That morning, on the patio of Byrne's Beverly Hills home, they held an emergency story conference about how to best explain Paul Byrne's real-life corpse. Searching among Byrne's papers, they chanced upon the draft of a letter, then left it out for the police to discover and to assume that it must have been his suicide note. Dearest dear, it read, Unfortunately, this is the only way to make good the frightful wrong I have done you and to wipe out my abject humiliation. I love you, Paul. There was a postscript. You understand last night was only a comedy. At Louis B. Mayer's behest, a prominent Hollywood physician announced that Paul Byrne had been impotent. Mayer wanted Harlow to confirm this and claim that it had ruined their marriage, but she refused. For once this woman, who had been manipulated all her life, stood her ground. She insisted she had been happily married to Byrne and that she loved him. The irony of it all was that Harlow's marriage to Byrne had never been consummated. But she was too loyal and too noble to say so. And the truth about Byrne's sordid death? Harlow's husband, it turned out, had a secret in his past. A common-law wife named Dorothy Millette. Byrne had been involved intensely with Millette a decade earlier and still supported her financially. Millette was mentally unstable and still obsessively attached to Byrne. The night of his death, Dorothy Millette had shown up at Byrne's house. Harlow arrived shortly thereafter. No one will ever know what happened between them but it was enough to push Paul Byrne over the edge to suicide. A few days after his death, Dorothy Millette also killed herself, jumping from a boat into the Sacramento River. With both Byrne and Dorothy Millette dead, Jean Harlow was seen as the helpless victim in a lurid love triangle. She suddenly seemed more vulnerable in real life than her fans had ever seen her in the movies. Three years later, Harlow starred in Reckless, playing an actress whose husband commits suicide. While Reckless painfully echoed her personal ordeal, as usual, Harlow yielded to the demands of the studio and accepted the part. One scene even exploited the drama of Paul Byrne's death. It was one of several times her films would seem to parallel her life. You might as well tell Mr. Riley's confess as you killed him. That's not true. It is the opinion of this jury that Robert Harrison Jr. came to his death by a bullet fired from a gun by his own hand. As a pity, then, as district attorney, I can do nothing. Technically, it was suicide. As a man and a member of this community and an old friend of the Harrison family, I feel that morally it was murder. Reckless ends with Harlow begging her audience not to hold her husband's suicide against her. No moviegoer in the 1930s could have missed the true life impact of her plea. How dare you? How do you dare? I tell you, I had nothing to do with that awful thing that happened. All I did was to marry a sweet, unhappy boy. Loving him. Hoping somehow to make him happy. 
I didn't. I couldn't. His, his unhappiness was too deep in him. So deep. He died. Of I had hoped to live again by singing, dancing as I wanted. That didn't seem too much to hope. But if it is, and if this is the last song I'm ever to sing for you, please have the, the decency to let me finish. Go ahead, Tom. For this song, Harlow's voice was dubbed, but the sentiment felt real. she played in Reckless, Harlow won over her own movie audience. Mail poured into MGM in support of Harlow. The studio moguls were astonished. Far from being destroyed, Jean Harlow was hotter than ever. To the amazement of the Hollywood establishment, she was the first star in history to survive a scandal. Urged on by her mother, Harlow returned to MGM to work on Red Dust with Clark Gable, just one week after Paul Byrne's suicide. It testifies to Harlow's dedication that she filmed this infamous rain barrel scene while still in mourning over the loss of her husband. How many times have I told you to let down those curtains? Why? They've all gone off to work. You heard me. Let them down. What's the matter? Afraid I'll shock the Duchess? Don't you suppose she's ever seen a French postcard? You let those curtains down, and this is the last bath you'll ever. Get out of there. Get out. Oh, no, don't, Denny. I'm in it. Now stop. Gee, can a girl take a bath in privacy without. Oh, good morning. You're just in time to see the train sealed. Hey, Denny, scrub my back. Get back in that chair. Oh, no, Denny. You just said you didn't want me in it. More occurrence like this, and you live in that shack across the river. I will not. And if you think I give a. Harlow and Gable had an explosive chemistry the talkies had never seen before. And for the first time, Harlow's hooker had a heart of gold. Here you are, kid. It isn't half enough. But when I get down to Saigon, there'll be more. Keep your chin up. Her sexuality would mix with her vulnerability, a combination which appealed to men and women alike. While many critics believed that Harlow had been playing herself in Red-Headed Woman, Red Dust proved she could act. Sixty years later, her performance remains both body and poignant. After the Byrne scandal, Red Dust saved not only Jean Harlow's career, but helped save MGM as well. Because in 1933, the Great Depression finally hit Hollywood. Ticket sales dropped in half. One third of the nation's movie theaters closed. MGM was the only studio to make a profit that year. Eight million dollars in great part because of red dust. Jean Harlow was now a superstar. Yes, I know it's 6 o'clock, and I know she's due on location at 7.30, and I know she's to wear the white dress without the brassiere. In Dinner at 8, her vulgar gold digger stole the show from some of the greatest screen actors of her time. John and Lionel Barrymore, Marie Dressler, and Wallace Beery. At age 22, Jean Harlow had arrived. Who do you think you're talking to? That first wife of yours out in Montana? Now you leave her that out of this. That poor mealy-faced thing with a flat chest that didn't have nerve enough to talk up Shut to Shut up. You? Washing out your greasy overalls and cooking and slaving in some lousy mining shack? Now when does she die? Say, I'll suck well, you, you in a minute. you can't get me that way. You're not going to step on my face to get where you want to go, you big windbag. Well, here goes for another day's work, and I'm dead on my feet already. What's the way out of this world case? Who knows? Who cares? What was it like to be a movie star in those days? It meant slipping into something uncomfortable. Harlow was often sewn into form-fitting gowns and not able to go to the ladies' room for hours at a stretch. She couldn't sit down and had to resort to a slant board like this one to rest. 
she was forced to diet heavily to maintain her figure. She suffered continual allergic reactions to the heavy studio makeup. She worked Monday through Saturday, sometimes 20 hours a day. Then on Sunday, she would have to go to the beauty parlor to dye her hair, its trademark, platinum blonde. But there was something Harlow disliked even more than all this. People couldn't separate her from her sexy roles. In 30s Hollywood, being beautiful meant being stupid. Harlow, an avid reader known for her wit, was definitely not stupid. Bowled over by her body, they ignored her mind. She once told her friend, they treat me like a bitch in heat. Perhaps no scene summed up Hollywood's attitude better than this classic from Dinner at Eight. I was reading a book the other day. Reading a book? Yes, it's all about civilization or something. A nutty kind of a book. Uh, Do you know that the guy says that machinery is going to take the place of every profession? Oh, my dear. That's something you need never worry about. Like her heroine in Bombshell, Harlow paid the bills to support Mother Jean and Marino Bello's extravagant lifestyle. Bello was also taking a hefty cut of Harlow's income as her self-appointed. Harlow's life mirrored her movies when, like one more wacky scene from Bombshell, two days after filming finished, Harlow eloped with her cameraman, Harold Rawson. Like Paul Byrne, Rawson was twice her age. And also like Byrne, Rawson had done much to shape her screen image, filming her in several earlier movies. Harlow liked Rawson and she trusted him. But Mother Jean opposed the marriage. Rawson never had a chance. After eight months, he and Harlow separated. Well, what's this? I don't recognize this. Retakes on red dust, the haze off a of sense or something, and the pictures got open Monday in New York. At the peak of her success in Bombshell, Jean Harlow was suddenly forced to change her screen image. In 1934, the Legion of Decency, a Roman Catholic censorship group, clamped down on studio films with a strict new production code. <laughs> the cheap, and the tawdry is out. Harlow's sizzling performances had done much to spark this new move toward censorship. Harlow would have to switch from playing bad girls to good girls, and fast. The code was going to be called Born to be Kissed. Under the pressure of the Legion of Decency, MGM changed the name to the more insipid The, the Girl from Missouri. I'm just the same girl as when I left home. The film was successful, but the way MGM saw it, Harlow couldn't be 100% pure, unless she also changed the color of her hair. For Riff Raff, she became a brownette, and to her relief, she never had to play a platinum blonde again. Hey, what's Nick to you, anyway? What do you mean? You know what I mean. What is he? Nothing. Nothing at all, except he wants to marry me. <laughs> marry you? Yeah. More importantly, Harlow played a virgin holding out for marriage, and the public bought it. Her transformation from bad girl to good girl was complete. It was the first time in Hollywood history that a star successfully made such an extreme change in her image. Harlow's screen roles now reflected her off-screen self. Oh, I'm sorry, V.S. I thought you were married. Get rid of that secretary of Vans. Miss Wilson? Van couldn't live without. I hope not with her. In Red-Headed Woman, she'd played a secretary who seduced her boss. In Wife vs. Secretary, she played an innocent secretary, wrongly accused of the same thing. We've had an awful lot to drink. Yes, we have. Harlow's screen characters had come full circle. You'd really better go. If you leave him now, you'll never get him back. Yes, that's occurred to me. He's going to be lonely. His life won't end with you, you know. And when the rebound sets in, he's going to turn to the woman nearest. And you know who it'll be. I'm sure I do. You're still going? Yes. You're a fool. For which I'm grateful. None of Jean Harlow's remaining films would ever capture her true self so accurately. The blue ribbon trying to marry me off to that, to that baboon! And I pronounce you man and wife. It's a testament to Harlow's acting that she could make this scene in Libeled Lady convincing, when what she wanted most of all was to marry Powell. By 1937, Jean Harlow had finally won respect from her fans and the film industry. Hold it, hold it, they've gone. Save it for the elevator. Oh. Oh! 
Women identified with her and men loved her. She combined physical beauty with a natural acting style and redefined movie acting. It's about Bill. Hey, I certainly had that guy all wrong. He's a wonder. <laughs> Congratulations. When did you come out of the ether? But she was desperately unhappy. For the first time in her life, Harlow couldn't have the man she wanted. Turned. Oh, how dare you? But Crystal, darling, haven't you been well? You look so tired. In the spring of 1937, Harlow began filming Saratoga, a horse racing story in her fourth pairing with Clark Gable. Hey, you look great in that kimono. It would be her last picture. Well, what did you want, Duke? What? Oh, I came to the doctor that cold of yours. Hey, you've got a fever. No, it's warm in here, that's all. Oh, yeah. Early in 1937, she fell ill with influenza, which caused delays in her work schedule. The influenza weakened her against a much more serious illness, kidney disease. No one knew it, but Jean Harlow was dying. In this scene, a doctor is called in to examine Harlow, who is already starting to look bloated due to her deteriorating health. Uh, oh, Dr. Beard. Oh, yes, uh, Dr. Beard just happened to be coming down, too. This is Miss Clayton, Dr. Beard. Oh, yes, yes. How do you do, my dear? How do you do? I thought Dr. Beard could look you over. This is absolutely ridiculous, Doctor. I told you there's nothing the matter with me. Quiet now, just relax. Miss Clayton, when was your wedding originally planned? Last August. That's five months ago. Dear, 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 dear. There's nothing organically wrong with that little heart, but it's beating much, much too fast. I told you I was all right. Of course, but you are a highly emotional type. The signs of kidney failure were already apparent. She had lost her appetite and was perspiring heavily. In retrospect, this playful scene with Gable has a somber undercurrent. For Harlow had only a few days left to live. If I live to be a thousand, I'll never forget the way you look coming out from underneath that couch. <laughs> Lie still, will you? <laughs> lie still. Hey, will you lie still? What's the matter? <coughs> you all right? Yes. On May 29, 1937, Harlow collapsed on the set of Saratoga. She was cared for at home for the next eight days. Contrary to legend, she received constant medical attention despite her mother's Christian science beliefs. Nonetheless, her condition worsened. On Sunday, June 6, she was rushed to the hospital.